So today I'm gonna answer some questions or react to some comments on uh, Reddit, so uh, let's get to it. Okay, so let's start with the uh, work-life balance. Those in STEM PhD programs in the US, what is your work-life balance? Is it easy for you to take trips either for leisure or to visit family with proper planning? What are your best tips for managing burnout but not missing out on opportunities? Okay, so in my opinion, you should treat your PhD like a job. And I worked eight hours a day, five days a week, and I would say that's probably the key to not burning out. Don't take it too seriously and don't be don't be working 12 hour days, six days, six to seven days a week. That's like, yeah, you can do that for periods, but that's probably not very efficient in the long run. Like it's a marathon, not a sprint. And so you should probably plan to not spend all day, every day working. As for uh, vacations and stuff, so vacations are pretty, um, it's quite few vacation days in the US. Well, I only got like two weeks of vacation and I got the vibe that it was kind of frowned upon to actually take that vacation also, but I didn't care. So just take the vacation, plan it and go, ask your supervisor and then you just go. It's not rocket science, this. Those are, those are my best tips for managing burnout. Also, not missing out on opportunities. If your advisor is requiring you to be in the lab 24-7, then it might not be the best advisor. I don't think it's... I don't think you should be missing, missing out on opportunities just because you want to have a life. Okay, do you openly disagree with your supervisor? The answer to that is yes. Uh, of course, I <laughs> disagree with my supervisor from time to time. Uh, but I'm not like, oh, you're an idiot. I'm not, I'm not telling them, oh, what? You think this? You're an idiot. I'm more like, yeah, I don't agree with that. I think... And then you argue for whatever it is, you, whatever it is you disagree with. And usually it's not a problem. That's if you have an advisor who has a problem with you disagreeing with them, that's probably not a great advisor. Prestige versus advisor fit. How did you choose your PhD program and how did it turn out? So I chose my PhD program partly based on location. So I, w I applied to the University of Vermont and that was partly because, so I wanted to go to the US and then I thought, what's the best place to live in the US? So I was thinking either West Coast or the Northeast and I thought Vermont, Vermont seems like, a, like one of the best locations in just based on my perception from the outside. And I think that was a pretty good call. Um, obviously, I looked at the university, the department. I knew I wanted to do organic chemistry, so I looked at um, at the faculty. There were multiple faculty who were doing organic chemistry that fit my interests quite well. And so that's how I chose my university. And I did not consider prestige at all. And I think that was a good call. I think prestige is overrated. Um, An advisor fit is maybe a little underrated. As for choosing my advisor, it was mostly based on the person I liked the most in the program. And I think it was a good call. Like, you need someone you're able to work with. Don't pick an advisor just because they're prestigious. Nobody gives a shit about your prestigious advisor. They might be a terrible advisor. And so I think it's more important what you do in your program rather than the perceived prestige of both your program and your advisor. Like if you have a lot of first author publications, if you have done a lot of good work, that's probably going to help you more than having a prestigious advisor. Of course, it might help a little bit, like going to a brand name school and having a famous advisor could help you a little bit, but if your publication record isn't isn't matching it, then it I think that also is gonna hold you back. 
is it possible to get a faculty position right after the PhD without doing a postdoc? Uh, so this depends on the discipline. Uh, yes, I know people who have gotten faculty positions without doing a postdoc. Although in many, I would say probably most disciplines, this is not common. It's very uncommon. Certainly in chemistry, it's very uncommon to be able to get a faculty position right after your PhD. So I, the person I know who got a faculty position right after their PhD was in a agriculture engineering or something like that. And uh, yeah, they got a, they, that was clearly possible for them to get a faculty position after their PhD. Okay, Springer Nature just approved full waiver of $2,999.90. APC. Oh, isn't Springer Nature generous? Only charging you $3,000 to take your research and make money off of it. For free. Yeah, Springer Nature allows the reviewers to work for free for them and taking the researcher's uh, work and uh, charging money for it, for all for free. Yeah, isn't Nature Springer generous? I feel like academic publishing is uh, an incredible business model. I feel like I should be getting into academic publishing. You just get everyone to do everything for you for free, and then you charge money for it to sell it back to them. It's, uh, it's, it's genius, actually. The hardest part about the PhD is everything else that has nothing to do with your research. Uh, yeah, that's true. Should I do a PhD at 33? My supervisor is suggesting me doing a PhD with a lab. My field is antenna RF component. Okay. So 33 is not that old. I started my PhD when I was 31. Um, so yes, you are going to be almost 10 years older. Or you're at 33, you're going to be approximately... 10 years older than most of your cohort, but I'm like, that doesn't matter that much to me. I, I did definitely feel that at least some in my cohort I would consider quite immature, but I'm also thinking that at age 23 I would have also found them somewhat Im immature, maybe. And I didn't really feel like I was that different even though I was ten, almost 10 years older. So that's one thing. Uh, and I feel like there's a lot of people who think, oh, now I'm over 30, now I basically got one foot in the grave. Like, bro, it's nothing. 33 is nothing. And if you have the life circumstances where you want, if you want to do it, you should just do it. It's not about age at this point. Okay, better PhD opportunities. Hello, good people. Currently, I'm pursuing a, a master's in finance at Queen's University, Belfast, UK, and I want to go for a PhD after the completion of the MSc. Seeking your advice regarding which country will be better suitable in terms of getting full funding and having a better career after the PhD completion, I'm thinking about English-speaking countries like the US, not UK, US, Australia, Ireland, Canada, although I'm open for other European countries as well. Luckily, I just did a video, or, or well, it's been a few weeks, but... I did a video on which countries are the have the best PhD conditions, and uh, well, the Nordic countries did quite well. So that was kind of a joke, the whole video, but it was also kind of true. <laughs> uh, so the Nordic countries speak very good English. The programs are in English. If you speak English language, there isn't really a language barrier in those countries. You can also get a job with a PhD. It's quite common to speak English in the workplace. A lot of people, a lot of internationals do a PhD in those countries. Of course, it would be beneficial to learn the language. And uh, if you move to those countries, you probably should, but it's not a requirement. Uh, of course, all the countries you mention are also possible. But, uh, you know, you that's Scandinavia is should definitely be an option. Declining a PhD after accepting. Okay, so I'm not gonna read all this, but I'm gonna just say it's fine. It happens all the time. 
it's not such a big deal. You got a better off or you got an offer you would rather take after you actually accept it. It's kind of a difficult situation because you have to just accept an offer you get because you don't know if you're going to get another offer. Uh, and then you happen to get another offer that you'd rather do. So it's fine. Just tell your PI you got another offer and you would ra- that you would rather take and then that leave it at that because it doesn't it happens all the time and they are prepared for it. Professors know that this happens all the time. Yeah, that awkward moment when your advisor says this won't take long and it ruins your entire week. Yeah, or he asks you to do a week's worth of work over the next 2 days on a Friday afternoon. And when you do that, On Monday morning, he's forgotten all about it. Could I contact PhD students of potential supervisors? Hi everyone, I'm considering applying for a PhD, and and before submitting my application, I reached out to a few PhD students who had graduated under potential supervisors. I thought it would be acceptable as long as I was polite. However, one person replied saying, It is very inappropriate. Please do not email again. Someone told me, it's unrealistic to expect res- expect a response from uh, PhD students since they do not know me. Any advice on how to write a polite and acceptable inquiry is appreciated. Okay, so number one, it's very much acceptable to write PhD students of prospective supervisors. In fact, it's smart. And to be honest... When I see this reply, I think there is something wrong with the person who gave that reply. (laughs) Like, it's quite strange to be like, oh, what, you shouldn't, it's inappropriate to contact people. It's like, just, unless you wrote something inappropriate, but I, like, I can't imagine it being, (laughs) it being inappropriate the way you write this. So I would consider this person to be a red flag <laughs> yeah, as, as, a, as a member of a group. I wouldn't want to be in a group with this person, if I'm going to be honest. Um, so for the, for the, that someone said it's unrealistic to expect a response from PhD students, uh, I would to some extent agree with that because it's like they don't know you. And especially if they're currently in the group. It's difficult for them to be honest, especially in writing. If they're going to be honestly critical of the advisor, that could have a negative... uh, If you then go and tell the advisor that this person uh, talked shit about them, then, you know, that can have negative consequences for that person. So that's definitely... uh, uh, Thing to consider. Often you will see people will talk in code, like they are very hands-on is code for micromanaging, or um, hands-off can be code for absent, or um, a challenge to work with can be <laughs> like... But of course, these are things you wouldn't write in an email necessarily because it, then it's in writing and then it's even it, even even the advisor will understand that this is code for them being a difficult person so that's a real concern so maybe you should contact people who have previously been in the lab but yeah it depends if you're able to find their contact information that's another thing um and any advice on how to write a polite and acceptable inquiry, just be polite. (laughs) And don't expect anything. Don't badger people, obviously. Just write an email. If they reply, they reply. If they don't, they don't. But this whole, it's inappropriate and unacceptable, that's total bullshit. Teaching wardrobe. Okay, so just wear normal clothes. I've seen people, I know people who wear suits for a teaching lab as a TA, just don't. It's weird. It's just wear normal clothes, clothes you would wear any other day. You don't need to do anything special. 
<laughs> like, don't wear a suit. Don't do anything. Unless it's like, that's the expectation. But if you, if everyone else wears normal clothes and you show up in like very overdone, I would <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> Just wear normal clothes. Whatever you wear on a normal day. PhD tips for money. Okay, I am about to start my PhD in the US. I'm not a US citizen. The yearly income is 41,000, but rent is 1,800 a month, I'm assuming. How did you guys manage your budget? Is this enough? What would you recommend? <laughs> I would say if you're making 41,000 a year, $1,800 a month is a lot. And you're gonna be poor in Boston. Like, you're not gonna have much money left, if I'm gonna be honest. And I don't really have any great recommendations <laughs> other than maybe finding a place that is uh, less expensive. Like, you have to have a lot of roommates to survive on 41000 in Boston. 1800 a month. I actually assume you already have roommates, because... I know that the housing market in Boston is insane, like most American cities. Um, yeah, I don't really have any great recommendations, but you're gonna be poor. Uh, yeah, but that's uh, that's all the comments I'm gonna go through today, and uh, I hope you learned something that you didn't know. And uh, but that's all for now, and uh, I'll see you in the next one.